Okay, so let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, good and gracious God, thank you for the, giving, uh, for the gift of our faith. We thank you that we know you, and we thank you that you came down to be one like us, to take our human form so that knowing you may be easier for us. Thank you for your generosity, for giving of yourself, making yourself available to us in all ways. Help us to be able to connect with the ways that you have shown to us. Help us to be able to put into practice what we learn from you. Help us to be devoted to the values that you show us and give us the courage to live out these values in our daily practical lives so that your intention, your goal for humanity may become a little bit more like heaven where you live and you reign forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, the topic I want to discuss with you today is living our faith in Advent. And uh, I know it's easy to, to, to uh, understand that, the reason why uh, we're going to talk about a, a theme like this or a topic like this is because in one week uh, we will be entering into a, uh, Advent, uh, a little over a week. We'll be entering into Advent and, and I want us to, to talk about what are we supposed to be doing? I have mentioned some parts of this in our Bible study when we were talking about the, the period uh, and, the, and the mood of people, of humanity, before Jesus Christ came. That is what is captured by the church. It's captured by the church to help church members to, to put themselves in that light. Although we have Jesus already, Jesus has already come to our midst, but we try to uh, revisit that mood when people were expecting Jesus Christ, when Christ was not in, uh, with them. Uh, God was with them, but Christ was not with them. So it, it's, a, it, it's a way to understand the fact that uh, uh, God was with them, but in a different way. In the way that God was with them was different from the way that God is in Christ. This is, this is why we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why we have the Trinity. It is God presenting God's self in different ways, in different relationships. Uh, uh, so, so before Christ, before Christianity, God was in the world. But God was in the world in one form, one way, uh, one face, one, one presentation. Or the best way for me to use that is one kind of relationship. The arrangement between God and human beings before Jesus Christ came was a relationship that was different from when Jesus Christ came. So when Jesus Christ came, God showed God's self. If you like, God just transformed God's self and rearranged God's self and presented God's self to humanity in a different arrangement so that human beings will be better, they will be able to better relate with God, uh, to better relate with God uh, than in the past. So we are talk, talking about different forms, forms of relationships. So if you're talking about uh, um, uh, uh, the Trinity, God, the Creator, God, the Redeemer, God, the Sanctifier. These are all relationships, kinds of relationship. Okay. But it, that is why we say it's the same God. It's just different kinds of relationship that God strikes with people. That's why we got the Trinity. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, to talk about how do we live our lives as Christians, as Catholic Christians, in the time of Advent, uh, and, and so so that and the goal here is to be able to gain some some new ways of practicing our Advent. Yes, granted, 
we are not going to be, uh, I mean, COVID-19 has, has uh, changed the whole way of experiencing this. But, but like I've t been telling people all the time, uh, it's no less uh, uh, diminishing of God's presence. God is still very present. And in fact, it's more present in your homes uh, than, than anywhere else. So, uh, so let's talk about that. And I'm going to break that into four sections. I'm going to talk about, um, oh, sorry. I'm going to talk about what is Advent. Uh, uh, what is Advent? I'm going to just unpack that, that word, Advent. And then we will talk about uh, 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 Advents of Advent. So in Advent, there are, there are Advents, uh, uh, little Advents. If you like, you can put, you can put the, the, word, the last word Advent in small letters. Uh, 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 the, the, and that's the big Advent. That's the whole, but in that little Advent, there are Advents. We don't celebrate only one Advent. We celebrate different Advents. And then we will do the... Uh, we will talk about the life of faith. What is faith? Because we are, t we are trying to talk about faith life in Advent. So we will then look at what are we talking about when we talk about the life of faith. And then finally, let us talk about uh, how faith is lived within Advent. You put the two together. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so we move on to what is Advent. Uh, this, is, this is not something that you don't know. These are things that you know already, but we're going to uh, talk about it in different ways, in, in different ways uh, to deepen your understanding of, of, of what we have been practicing all the time. Um, so the, the word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, uh, the Latin word Adventus, which means arrival or Advent or somebody coming to you, or uh, uh, in, this, in this way, Jesus coming to us, God coming to our world, uh, God arriving. Or, or also it means the season of Advent, the season, uh, the time frame of, of, of God coming to our world. Okay. So, so there was a time that God became part of our world. Not, not, no more being, uh, standing by and throwing laws at us, but actually became one of us. So it's like, it's like, it's like if you want to do, uh, you, want to, you, can, you can do good, you can help people uh, uh, who are poor, uh, or you can give them money to, to, to pay their rent, or do something, and then you can also go and help them build a house. That's two different things. <laughs> yeah, to actually go into the trenches, not, not just give them money, but actually go there and try your hands and nail the wood and, and help them do it together. Uh -huh. uh, so um, uh, God, in the old relationship, God used to throw laws at them. Uh, Give them laws, give them, but God was not uh, with them in that way. God was with them in the law, in the law. That's why they have the law of Moses. The law of Moses was, was God. The law was God. The law was actually what was called the, the covenant. And that's what was put in the ark. That is the presence of God among them. It's in the law. Okay. The law is God. Okay. Uh, but, but in this new arrangement, uh, God ca came to humanity. That is the advent. Advent tells us that God now coming down, coming to human beings and then working it with human beings and entering into a relationship with human beings practically so that God is not away from you anymore. That God is, uh, uh, remember that we, we, read, we read this text from Jeremiah. 31, 31 through 34, that prophesied the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, it says, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant uh, with humanity. And this time around, that covenant is going to be written on their hearts. It's no longer going to be outside that they have to look for, 
but they look into themselves and they find God, God in their hearts. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So if you hear the word Advent again, put it in that way, arrival, uh, arrival, uh, uh, the coming of Jesus Christ and the season itself. And then uh, in that case, if you're trying to know what Advent is, where Advent fits is the liturgical season. Uh, the liturgical season of Advent uh, starts our liturgical year, okay? The liturgical season starts the liturgical year. That's what we start with. Remember when we're in a, in a Bible study, uh, we talked about that. That before we would like to talk about uh, 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 Jesus' life, we have to talk about the time before he, he was born. So that time uh, is Advent. So that's what the liturgical season is arranged around the life of Jesus. Our liturgical year is arranged around the life of Jesus. So from Jesus' birth to his death and his departure, uh, his ascension into, into heaven, this is the liturgical year. Okay. So, so as you can find, uh, Advent has four weeks, four weeks that precede, uh, four weeks that precede Christmas. Okay. So we start the liturgical year with Advent, four weeks, and then we celebrate Christmas. And then that's when Jesus was born, Christmas, Jesus was born. And then there was a time between uh, Christmas and Lent. That time we read the Gospels about, about the preaching, the teaching, the working of Jesus Christ. Okay. Jesus' own work, what he did. Uh, and then that work will lead him to be killed because people don't like it. People don't like what he was saying. People don't like his preaching. People don't like his... People resisted. And not many people who accepted Jesus. Like we said, 95% 95 of the Jewish community did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Okay. So he got the biggest opposition. So um, uh, recently I was, I was talking about, uh, there was this issue about, um, I, uh, I mean, there were some pushbacks on some of the things, some of the uh, 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 policies and some of the ways that I, I was I was working uh, in, in uh, some of the decisions I was making. Obviously, I, you can't get hundred percent to agree with you in anything. You cannot. If you get hundred uh, percent, you are in trouble. It's a bad thing to get hundred percent. So you will get some pushbacks, uh, but but I I had like. I had like uh, eighty percent, or sometimes seventy-five percent of people agree with me. I'm like, that's better than what Jesus got. <laughs> that's better than what Jesus got. I was lucky, <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, sometimes, if you get 40 percent with human beings, if you get forty percent, you're doing good. Uh, so, <laughs> so. Uh, many people did not accept Jesus, so that led to his death. That's the first ordinary time. O -O OT means ordinary time. So ordinary time one uh, is, is the time that Jesus was preaching and working and teaching, and that led to his death. So if we are going to talk about his death, we must prepare for it, and that is why we go into Lent. So Lent becomes the next thing after Jesus' we have talked about Jesus' life, uh, preaching and teaching. And then Lent prepares us to celebrate his, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. That is Easter. His suffering, his death, and his resurrection. So Easter is the biggest. Easter is the climax. Is the, is the Super Bowl of 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 Jesus's life of Christianity Easter is Easter is the biggest in fact it is Easter that we look at and start talking about everything else you start you look at Easter and then you start interpreting the Easter celebration uh, the resurrection of Jesus gives us understanding of what his life is about okay 
is the resurrection. The resurrection is like our eyeglasses. It is what, it is through which we interpret every other thing. The resurrection is the climax. So after we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, well, Jesus, after accomplishing his work, uh, now has to give his work to, uh, to people, hmm? for us. Now, this is why he came. He came to the world to teach the world how to relate with God in a better way. To teach the world how to relate to God in a better way. And so, when he has finished his work by suffering, dying, and rising from the dead, he has accomplished his job, and therefore, he gave the work to people who will, who will tell uh, their fellow brothers and sisters. And, and therefore, we talk about the, the work of the followers of Jesus. What they did is what we celebrate throughout the ordinary time too, uh, OT2. That's what we talk about. We talk about how we are Christians in the world, how we put Jesus' work into practice. Uh, and how we teach. So the, that's the work of the church. And, and so Advent begins every liturgical year. So the ordinary time too that I've just spoken about, that ends. We are in it still right now, but it's going to end this coming Sunday. It's the last Sunday of ordinary time too. Okay? And what we do is that the last Sunday we celebrate the feast of Jesus Christ, King of the, of the universe. Jesus Christ is hailed as the King. He is the beginning and the end of the liturgical year. Okay. Uh, Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end of the liturgical year. So after this coming Sunday, then we will go, we'll go into our first Sunday of Advent, the new year, the new liturgical year. Okay. Um, so before I talk about the next one, let me just say one more thing. Uh, we normally read, so the Gospels, we we're talking about the Gospels, there are four Gospels. But the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, those three Gospels, uh, we read each of them in a particular liturgical year. So... This past year, the book, the Gospels that we have been using at Masses is only Matthew's Gospels on the Sundays. Matthew's Gospel. So if you take the Gospel, if you follow the Gospels very well every Sunday, at the end of the liturgical year, you would have read one Gospel. So you can try it and follow from now on, uh, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, Start reading the Gospel of Mark. Read with the church, the church's Gospels, uh, uh, the Sunday Gospels. You will realize that by next year, around this time, you will be finishing uh, the Gospel of Mark. We have just finished, we are finishing Matthew right now. We are going into the Gospel of Mark. Okay. And, and so the liturgical years are labeled A, B, C. The liturgical year A is when we read Matthew. So we are in year A right now, which we are finishing. So we are going to go into year B, in which we'll be reading the Gospel of Mark. Mark. And then, the, the, in 2020, uh, 20, at the end of 2021, going into 2022, we will be reading the Gospel of Luke which is year C, okay, C, C, uh, as in A, B, C. So, so that's it. And then you have the Gospel of John. We normally read the Gospel of John in Easter time. Mm -hmm. In Easter time. We read most of the Gospel of John in Easter time because the Gospel of John is very different, very different from the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so we, we make that a special gospel for, for the Easter season. Okay. So um, now, what is the symbolism of Advent? Uh, uh, what is the symbolism? What does it symbolize? What does Advent symbolizes? 
again, I told you in our, in our Bible study, we talk about the period before Jesus came is a period of expectation and preparation. That was the mood. That was a feeling of people, the feeling of humanity. And we believe that it's also the feeling of people who are yet to receive Christ. And it's also the feeling of ourselves right now, even though we have Jesus, when we, we, when, when we forget about the presence of Christ in us, this is what we feel. We feel anxious, we feel uh, expectation, we, we, we feel all these things, right? And, and we are, and, but the word to capture all of that is anticipation. Anticipation. Okay. So anticipate, we're anticipating uh, the coming of Jesus. This is what, these are the key words of Advent, of Advent time. Anticipation, which comes in the form of expectation and preparation uh, uh, so so we do prepare now i'll tell you more about that as we go forward so um so then what is the content of advent so i said there are advents in advent okay uh, in every advent season there are four weeks but there are advents that we celebrate within them now some people look at this in in three advents, others look at it in, in two advents. I mean, classically, originally, the church teaches that we have two. Uh, these days, uh, some people can, can make it three in order to break it down, to break it down for us, but everything is in the two. If you think about it as two, you have, you, based on the way it is explained, you have everything that you need uh, to understand about Advent. So we are talking about two anticipations. Okay. We have two Advents within every Advent. Two Advents. Uh, uh, which means two arrivals. Arrivals of Jesus Christ. Uh, there are two arrivals that we recall, not just one. And the first one is our expectation and our preparation for the second arrival or second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is the preparation for the second coming of Christ is between now of your life to the end of your life. What you do right now, waiting for Jesus to come back again, this is the second advent. This is the second arrival of Jesus, second expectation. Right now, that's what we're expecting. We're expecting Jesus to come back again to take us to himself. Like in John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Uh, John, chapter 14, we read this text a lot in, uh, in, at funerals. When Jesus says, do not, uh, uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. And he says, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself. I will come back again and take you to myself. For us Christians, we believe that at the death of every Christian is interpreted as Jesus has come back for me. So death actually should be experienced by Christians of faith. We should experience death as, as a beautiful, as a wonderful thing. That's, that's hard. But our faith should be able to let us experience death as Jesus coming for us. This body could not do anything anymore. This body got sick and could not do anything anymore. So, so now uh, Jesus wants to be with us 
but this body is no more useful for, 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 for that relationship, that full. Jesus wants to have us fully because he himself is spirit now. He himself is spirit. So, so death is when Jesus has come. That's the way we should look at death. Now, we are human because we are flesh. That's why we cry, we mourn, we do all that because we are flesh. And we can't see the flesh anymore. We understand things in our flesh. So sometimes we look at death as a tragic thing. But actually in faith, we shouldn't. There's a, God, there's a first reading that we read at funerals always that says, uh, The souls of the just are in the hands of the Lord. They seem in the eyes of the foolish to be dead, but they are alive. Well, when the Bible talks about foolish, it talks about lack of knowledge of what God, God's ways are. Uh, not, not foolish in the sense of like fools, no. But uh, it not, not knowing the depth, the meaning of, of, of faith. So, so death, is, death is something that, I mean, we will try every time to try to come to grips with because we all have to experience that. And God, Jesus Christ changed the meaning. That's why Jesus died. He died so that he would transform the understanding of death to us. So, so the second coming of Jesus is when Jesus will come back for you. And therefore, Advent or waiting or expectation and preparation towards that is this time of your life. I don't care where, where you are in life, whether whether you are, you, are, you are 100 years old or you are one year old, from now to the time you will die, the things you do are your advent, your second advent, your preparation to meet Jesus when he comes again. Okay. So that's my life between now and my death. And this thing, this second advent, is what we begin advent with. Not the first advent. We begin with the second advent. So you will see the gospel readings, uh, the gospel reading when you go to Mass on the first Sunday of Advent and the second Sunday of Advent, the first two weeks, we commit the first two weeks to talk about the second advent, our life right now. And so you will hear the gospel reading talking about stay awake, be vigilant, be aware, Live your life. Do not be sleeping. Uh, keep awake and keep, keep being strong. Uh, uh, persevere and all that. That's what the gospel is telling you. The gospel talks about the end of life, the end of your life. Will you be ready when, when Jesus comes for you? Uh, when the master comes back to take you, will you be ready? Or you will say, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, I got to go do this first. Oh, I got to go. No, no, no. So you have to stay awake right now. You have to be ready right now. Like uh, the former pastor of, uh, former pastor of uh, uh, CCOP, uh, Pleasant Father Dan Daniel, the late Father Dan Danielson, used to tell the congregation, live your life every day with your bags packed. Live your life every day with your bags packed, ready to get on board when Jesus comes. Uh, we don't know. We don't know when we will all go. So, so always get your affairs in order. Be alert. Be on top of things about your faith. Okay. So that is the first and second week. And so pay attention to the first and second week of Advent about the gospel reading and listen to the messages that come out of it. It's all talking about your life right now and how prepared you are, how awake you are, how aware you are about your Christian life. Okay, so that's it. And then, and then on the third on the third uh, Sunday of Advent, the third and fourth Sunday of Advent is dedicated to the first time Jesus came. The first time Jesus came. That's all you can. We, it's our anticipation, which is our expectation and preparation to celebrate the first arrival 
of God in human form. That is Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ's birth. That's Christmas. So we spend the last two Sundays in Advent to prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus, to celebrate Christmas. And Christmas, what Christmas actually means, this is, this is an adult Christian understanding of Christmas. It's not, it's not, we talk about it, it's not baby Jesus at all. It is actually about, about how Christ was born into my life. When you came to know Christ, when you were baptized, you were born with Christ. Okay. Because you didn't know Christ uh, before you were born. So when you were, when you were, when you were born in the baptism, that's when, baptism is when you were introduced to Christ. Now you became part of Christ. Okay. You were human, but then you, be, you became part of Jesus Christ. That was baptism. So actually Christmas is about our baptism too. Christ was born into our lives and we were born into his life. We became part of him and we got his name on ourselves, Christian. Baptism makes you a Christ one. Okay. So you become part of Jesus Christ. And that was the anointing that they anoint us when we are baptized. So that is what we are recalling. Christmas is about baptism, really. When we came to know Christ. And we celebrate that in the, in, in the third and fourth Sundays. Now that idea, the idea that Christmas is Christ born into our lives and we are born into Christ's life. That idea was in play in the 380 of the church's life. 380. Okay. Two, two, over 200 years after uh, Christianity, this, this idea was, was especially with the, with the Irish or Gaelican, Gaelican spirituality. This idea came from that, from their uh, understanding uh, and, and that's very important for our lives, our baptism. Uh, for some reason, that tells, that tells you also that Christmas is joined to Easter. Uh, Christmas and Easter are like in a lockstep. They are, they are like that. They are not, you can't think about Christmas without the understanding of Easter. You can't understand Christmas well. Because being born, being baptized is also, is also uh, coming from the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That's why we got our baptisms. So all that is, is linked. So now uh, we have those two anticipations okay, that we, we look at. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to it when we are celebrating them. It makes a whole lot of sense if you have a background like this and you're following the church, the church uh, 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 liturgy. So there is this notion of joyful expectation. We say you are expecting, but I know that you and I, uh, expectation, the moment of expectation is not a, it's not a pleasant thing. When people, ex people want to arrive, right? People want to arrive and then they know that everything is that. But, but to be in limbo, to be in between and expecting is not a comfortable thing. Okay. However, this kind of expectation is a comfortable one. It's a joyful one. Why? Because of the fact that Advent is connected to Christmas. Advent, you, if you talk about Advent, you have to talk about uh, Christmas because Advent talks about arrival. Arrival of who? Arrival of Jesus Christ. And that, if you know what Jesus Christ is going to bring you, that causes your expectation to be a joyful one. Okay. Your expectation is not one. If you are expecting the arrival of somebody who is going to kill you, well, that, that's going to be bad. <laughs> that's, going to be, that's not going to be a good expectation. Uh, but you're expecting somebody who is going to redeem you, somebody who is going to make your life 
sweeter and better and joyful and just. It's going to make your relationship with God sharp because for a joyful expectation. Okay. So, so that notion, joyful expectation, characterizes the preparation, the living, our living uh, of, of, of uh, Advent. Okay, so that's Advent or Advent. So you know the Advent or Advent. I, I didn't tell you about the, the, those who talk about it in three, three ways. I talked about it in two ways, which is a traditional, this is the main understanding of the church, that Advent is two Advents. One for the coming of our, the second coming of our Savior Jesus Christ, and then the other for the first coming of Jesus Christ, that's Christmas. Some talk about it like, uh, uh, the first coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ, but then the third one is now, how I live my life now. But that is what I just explained in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, that you present, the present time. Some make that another advent. Okay. Some speak about that, uh, which is legitimate, but, but um, they are all saying the same thing. If you think about it as these two, which is the traditional way of understanding it, it still makes sense. Now, so what is a life of faith? Uh, what, what is the kind of life that we are going to color, uh, we are going to season with, with the notion of Advent or with the period of Advent? Because we have to season. Advent is like a seasoning. Mm? It's a seasoning. Like a seasoning you put on fish or meat or marinate stuff and make it more. Yeah, so, so that seasoning you use, it, you use Advent as a seasoning to season your Christian life every year. Advent is going to come again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. So Advent itself is like a season, seasoning. Huh? So when we look at it that way, then we understand what we are doing here. We have our Christian lives already. You have your marriage life. You have, I have my priesthood life. I have my, my... All of us have our jobs cut out for us. Now... Advent is the brings us a seasoning to spice our life, to make our life, uh, to, to, to look at our life in that, in that situation. So what is that life that we're going to season with Advent? So our faith life is what I'm talking about here. It's about Christian spirituality. Uh, that Christian spiritual, spirituality is how you relate with God, uh, how you relate with the divine. Christian spirituality is how Christians connect to God. And, and, and that has those three dimensions that we're talking about for the church also. Your relationship with God has those three departments. You have a learning, you have to be learning, you have to be studying the word of God. You have to be listening to your conscience. You have to read the signs of the time. You have to learn every day. You have to be open to learning every day about Jesus Christ. You shouldn't stop learning until you die. You shouldn't stop learning. Always there will be something to learn. And then you shouldn't stop devotion to the values of Christ or the person of Jesus Christ. Continue to worship Jesus Christ. Uh, continue to, to praise Jesus Christ. And that also includes, uh, uh, liturgy also includes prayer. Huh? Liturgy includes prayer. You pray you, and, and, and you ask God for things, but you also praise God. Praise God. Sometimes just praise God. Don't even ask for anything. Just praise God for who you are. Thank you and praise you, O oh God. Just, just shower praises on God. And just leave it there because you believe that God knows if you need something, God knows it before you even think about it. Okay. That's, sometimes we should spend our lives like that. And then, uh, and then living, living is about serving, serving, serving people other than yourself. Mm? Practical living that you should always be going out of yourself to do things for other people, to help better the life of people. Some other people, uh, 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 always, that's not going to stop. These three things we must always be doing, learning, uh, worshiping, liturgy, or uh, uh, living, uh, serving beyond our, ourselves, okay? or, or, or even our families. 
So that's one way, one, one aspect of lo looking at Christian spirituality or Christian life that you have to season Advent with. You can also look at the Bible and see there are some parts of the Bible that tell us what the Christian life looks like. Okay, So if you look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, it spells out, it spells out what Christian life is about. The poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek and humble people. That's, that's the Christian life. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are merciful, who forgive. Forgiveness. Blessed are those who, who, um, who are mourners, who are feeling, always yearning for Christ. That's mourning. To mourn is to mourn for Christ. You want Christ to be, be with you more and more. That's yearning. And there's something called, my soul is yearning for you, my God, right? Uh, uh, we always have to mourn for Christ. We need Christ in our lives. So all that, all that are parts of Christian life that we have to find in our own lives. Uh, we season these things with Advent. And then, and then there is also in, in John, in John, uh, in the Gospel of John, I've forgotten the, the I've not, I didn't put the, the text there, but I'll, I'll get to the text. But surely it is at the point where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Remember that, that we practice at Easter time on Holy Thursday. At that point, he told them, I'm giving you a new commandment. He says, Love one another as I have loved you. That's a new formula. Love one another as I have loved you. We call that phrase the mandatum. That is why we call Holy Thursday, Moundy Thursday. Yeah. Moundy Thursday is the commandment Thursday. That is when we get the basic commandment of Christianity. Love one another, not even love, love your neighbor as yourself, not even that anymore. But he said that when he was teaching, when he was walking and, and answering questions. But before he left them, before he died, he says, I give you a new commandment. And this commandment, the standard, uh, uh, I want you to love, not as you love yourself, but I want you to love as I love. That's a bigger, that's a higher bar, okay, to love like Jesus loves. So that's, that's the Christian, that's the thing that we have to season Advent with. It's a Christian life. And finally, the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are what will happen if you actually live the Christian life. What will happen? Um, you will find it in, in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, but I, I will find the text for you. But he says, the fruits of the Spirit are patience. Uh, uh, generosity, uh, peace, uh, joy. All these things will happen if you live the Christian life. And if you season the Christian life with Advent, these are the things, the fruits. Uh, the fruits are outcomes. They are, they are uh, destinations. Okay. So, so these are the Christian life. These are the kind of things we will be looking at. And, and then in Advent time, we try to incorporate the Advent theme to season. We make, we spice these kind of living with, with the, the messages of Advent. Okay. Uh, so Advent is not a goal mm -hmm. uh, because it's a catalyst. It's a seasoning. It's not a goal. Instead, it is in service of another reality. Okay. So it's a means to a goal. Uh, and what is that goal? The goal is that God becomes human, so humans become divine, like God. Uh, humans who become like God. So there's that two things. Uh, God become human, so that human beings can learn to be, live their lives like gods, uh, like, like, like God himself. Uh, they will live their life like that. So that's why they become divine. We live divine ways, but the way we reach out to each other, the way we relate with our spouses, the way we relate with our friends, with our church members, with our countrymen and women, that is a divine thing, not, not, not the way we've been, the selfish way many times uh, human beings live. 
So what does that, uh, uh, that mean? That God becomes human so that humans become divine? So you see, Christ's birth is when God becomes human. Okay, Jesus is being born. Is it, I'm just unpacking these things for us to uh, 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 pick them apart, analyze them. When, when Christ was born, uh, 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 God becomes human. But at the same time, these things are not by themselves. They, are, they work at the same time. When Christ is, uh, uh, Christ is born, he, God becomes human. And then human, uh, when humans, so that's when humans die. Yeah? Or you die to, the, to, to human so that you become divine. The human being can become divine, uh, can begin to be godly, godly things. This is why baptism is like, baptism is like dying with Christ. And that is why Jesus commands us to love uh, to death. Uh, when you die, that's a sacrifice. We celebrate uh, like the Eucharist. We sacrifice ourselves so that other people can have something. That's dying. To die is to break something that you have, break it, and share it. Share it with somebody. That's a form of dying. Uh, and, and so human death. Uh, so it doesn't mean that you die, you go to the grave, but every day in your life you're sacrificing. You, sacrificing is the action of God. It's a godly action. It's a divine action. Okay? So you're sacrificing yourself it means human death. That means you, human become divine. So these are the two things that happen when, when, when we're celebrating, we're looking at Christmas, God becoming human, and at the same time, human beings becoming divine. Like one of, uh, I think it's uh, St. Clement. He says, uh, the humanization of divinity is the divinization of humanity. Okay? The humanization of divinity is the divinization of humanity. Those, that's the, that, those two things go together. The humanization of divinity is the divinization of humanity. That's the formula. That's what happens in Christmas. That's, that's, what, that's what God becoming human is all about. God became human, the humanization of divinity, so that uh, 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 the, the humanization of divinity is the divinization of humanity. Yeah. All right. Human and divine having that interaction together, okay? So, uh, to complete this, uh, a question that I want you to put, have in your mind all the time, especially in Advent time, is that you find this in the Psalms also. A lot of it is in the Psalms. My soul is yearning for, and you can put something there. <laughs> Think about it. What, what is your soul yearning for? Okay, uh, so I want you to complete that sentence for yourself and see how concretely, practically, you are looking for that thing that, that your soul is yearning for. Uh, uh, so so uh, if we had, like, we had the opportunity to sit um, physically, we would have gone deeper into that. But, but for now, I want you to carry that question in your mind uh, and see how, how, how uh, you are informed and how you are uh, 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 inspired by it okay, in your life. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to look at, uh, see if there are some questions uh, uh, to be answered. Okay, so if we only read John during Easter, who was John originally speaking to, and what is the time period? Why does the Catholic Church consider this gospel so important that it's read annually at Easter? Okay, so, uh, so uh, uh, even, though, even though I've said that, so the, the three gospels are read A, B, and C, there are some times that we, we that we, we, we intersperse it with some other gospel. 
Now, John is read in, in Easter time, but it's also read at certain points of each of the three years, okay? Especially when we have to do, talk about the bread of life discourse, okay? Uh, the bread of life. Now, let me answer your question directly. The reason why this gospel is very important is that it's the gospel that talks about signs, symbols. It's a philosophical, it's, a, it's a, John does not give you stories, not, not too many stories. It tells you about symbols, okay? Uh, uh, symbols, like, like, you know, that Jesus sat at table. Uh, the other three Gospels, they tell us about Jesus sat at table and ate with the disciples at the Last Supper, okay? They ate a meal. John only talks about that. John talks about uh, the fact that... Uh, uh, he ate a meal with them. He just mentions the, he ate a meal with them. But then at table, he just washed their feet instead. So John talks about, he's the only one who taught, the Gospel of John is the only one that talks about washing of the feet. The other, other Gospels don't talk about washing of feet. But what he meant there is that the eating with them, what the eating with them means is the washing of feet. That we should watch each other's feet. When you eat with somebody, you accept the person into your life. When you eat with somebody, if you, if you don't like somebody to be part of your life, you don't eat with that person. But when John talks about that story, the washing of the feet, remember when, when Jesus got to Peter to wash Peter's feet, what did Peter say? He said, no, you're not going to wash my feet. You are my master. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I do not wash you, you will have no part of me. If I don't wash your feet, you will have no part of me. So John uses symbols to show what life the other Gospels are talking about. Okay. Uh, the other Gospels talk about literally he was eating with them. But John skips over to talk about what the eating with them means, the significance of it. John talks about signs, significance, signs only. Uh, so also, John doesn't have the birth, uh, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, in the manger. John has nothing like that, nothing like that. No Jesus on the baby Jesus in the manger and all that. Nah, no Bethlehem, nothing like that. Okay. Uh, but does he say something? Yes, he says something about what the birth of Jesus means. John begins his gospel and says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the only Son of God. John was just talking about science. The birth of Jesus means God who is in the God's word, became like us, took on human flesh. Okay. So that is why this gospel reading, this gospel is a special one. Uh, and so we took that, uh, we took its accounts and placed it in the Easter time. And then uh, I, I, I want to let you know that we read it also in other times, different particular Sundays, within each of the year uh, to supplement for them. But, but mainly we read it in, 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 uh, in Easter time. Okay. That's why, why it's special. Okay. It's called the Book of Signs. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'm glad to see you. Uh, you know that uh, the pandemic uh, has, uh, is not letting out. On us, and so uh, we will have to quarantine again. We have to go back to our our uh, shelter in place mode until it is safe to come back. So uh, you will receive a flock note tomorrow about how we go forward with our masses. Uh, but whatever it is, there will always be communion distribution on Sundays after mass. So so you can always come come for communion. 
thank you and may Almighty God bless you and give you restful sleep, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.